How's it going, everyone? So recently, I interviewed New York City-based tenor saxophonist Lucas Pino, who is also a multi-instrumentalist, composer, band leader, and is one of the most in-demand sidemen in the scene today. So for a little background information on Lucas, right after high school, he attended the Brubeck Institute, and right after that, he ended up finishing his bachelor's degree at the New School, and went on to finish his master's degree at the Juilliard School. Most currently, and before the pandemic of course when things were put on hold, he led a monthly residency with his renowned nine-piece group, The No Net Nonet. Their first album release was in 2015, followed by a 2017 release and a 2018 release, and a soon-to-come release that Lucas mentions in the interview that you should all keep an eye out for. So for more information, check out the links below in the description, and let's get started with the interview. Hey Lucas, how's it going man? Hey, it's going really well, Peter. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks for being on the show. Um, so uh, I guess we'll dive right into some of the questions here. Oh, lovely. How did you first get into music? I used to sing songs before I talked. My parents recognized that I had songs that I would sing based on whether I wanted to eat or different feelings and things like that. And um, really? yeah, I know it's super funny i guess um when i think about it now um and then i just like most people i joined uh middle school band i guess it was earlier than that fifth fifth grade grade. 10 years old uh band there was a choice between that and study hall and uh, i uh initially i brought home a permission slip saying that i wanted to play trumpet because i thought everybody would want to play the saxophone thinking that it was so cool my dad said to me if you think the saxophone is cool you should play the saxophone and um we were a family of meager means at the time and uh he said you know go check out see if you can get a school instrument and so i did and to my surprise like i came back from like the first band class and he had bought me a saxophone and made this huge impression on me and he took me into his office and apparently he was big saxophone fan himself jazz fan and he wrote down on, he had a whiteboard and all these jazz uh, CDs um, and and he wrote down like these are my favorite saxophonists John Coltrane uh, Stan Getz Cannonball Adderley and all these records you can listen to them anytime and and it uh, it really was a bonding moment and it made a crazy impression on me obviously and um, wow ever since then I, I always felt like jazz was my thing like he gave that to me like he made it belong to me and yeah it's been, nice been i guess as a stuff. side note um it sounds like you had like quite an introduction a lot of people start with the band stuff then later they might get exposed to a couple things until they get to college or study mm-hmm. with someone so was your dad a musician no nah, my dad is a businessman or he was you know he's retired now and okay he was an in international business he's originally from uh puerto Penasco in northern sonora mexico and okay. um so he does international business and Spanish speaking countries and uh, avionics and things like that. And wow. honest to God, I don't, I don't know why he's so cultured. He knows about all the symphonies and he knows uh, lots of literature and he knows uh, lots of jazz recordings. And I don't know wow. what his deal is. He's interested, <laughs> he's an interested kind of guy. So that's great, I was very man. fortunate. Yeah, 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 I feel fortunate. That's great. Why did you choose the saxophone? Yeah, I chose the saxophone because it looked the coolest. Okay. It looked cool. It had the keys on it. Uh, I probably had an impression of saxophone from, like, popular culture. You know, it's being, like, you know, sexy instrument or, (laughs) you know, smooth instrument or something like that. But when I think back to that time, I I also just associate it with being the coolest, the most popular. Yeah. And... um, that's why I chose it, I think. If I, if I had to say, if I had to go back 23 years. <laughs> what saxophonist or musician has had the greatest impact on your playing? I remember that first day that I had that saxophone, my dad put on that uh, 1958 Bahia John Coltrane record. And I just started trying to play along with it right away. And I'm still trying to play along with it. So <laughs> probably train, you know. Um train. And, and and listening to that music when I was little, I also felt like I was like transported into the 
the, the record player. Like you could on those old recordings, you can hear the room so well mm-hmm. that it gave me this like auditory impression. Like I was almost sucked into that space. And so train, I mean, in high school, Michael Brecker made a real impression on me. It was just like the technique. And, yeah, you know, I just thought that that was such a remarkable demonstration of saxophone. And that's like, amazing only later did i learn like that this dude was like just obsessed he's an obsessive learner and practicer um and same with train and and the impression that train made on me later also was that like he kind of came late to the music in a way in a manner of speaking and um and yet he still shaped himself into just like this unbelievable powerhouse influential across generations figure and so uh yeah that was super inspiring and the lesson that i took away from that is that you know you don't know what you're going to get out of this thing when you put it when you put yourself into it and you really try to learn and um are diligent and disciplined about practice the results are like you can't you can't you couldn't plot a course to say like this is where i'm going to end up this is my goal Mm -hmm. uh I don't think Train was thinking like I'm going to change the world or nothing like that. Maybe he was trying to heal the world through the music and yeah. try to like get closer to God, but like I don't think he was thinking like in any self-aggrandizing way. And um it's that that's super inspiring, it's still inspiring. Yeah, that's great. I guess to related to this to go off on a slight tangent. Would you say you consider yourself pretty lucky being able to be a jazz musician and, you know, as well versed on the saxophone and or any other instrument and in the music to be able to say a lot that you have because I've always wondered if other folks that don't have that to be able to express themselves through improvisation, jazz improvisation specifically, have that means of, yeah, I don't know. I definitely do. I feel as though it's a fundamental desire to be expressive. And um, a lot of times, man, I, I got hangups that keep me from being able to express myself well, just using the language. And uh, obviously, you know, throughout humanity, there's there's all kinds of mediums that people have used, and I, yeah, so I, I feel extremely fortunate that that I have the saxophone, and especially, you know, I feel like language fails in so many ways. You know, you're tra- like you're talking about verbal language. Yes, yeah, yeah, like my language fails me in a way that the music has been able to um, express feelings about spirit and bigness and and connectivity that I just can't. You know, I guess I'd have to, I'd have to go to, I went to music school for a long time. I got, I'd have to go to like literature school or something like that to really f- figure out how to express myself in, in that way. And so, yeah. yeah, I feel super grateful to it. You know, it's, it's been a transformative force in my life, no doubt. Yeah. Nice, man. I think a lot of us could relate. So I know I think I feel lucky as well. So thanks for sharing that. In terms of your career, could you tell us a little bit about how you got to where you are now? Yeah, I it's so funny, man. My perspective has vacillated between self-aggrandizement and self-diminishing uh reflection. Some some days you think like, "Oh, man, I'm going to take over the world," and other days you realize like there's no path, you know? Um and I've kind of settled in this mode where I'm just focused on process. Uh you know, like I know that good things happen when I practice. Mm-hmm. Good things happen when I write. And, and when I study the saxophone and I study this music and I study writing and I study those things, good things kind of result of it. So I don't really know what the industry is or what my career even is. I can't say with any certainty that I know myself in those ways, but that if I can just stay focused on, on a daily task and the process, good things have really happened. And a lot of times what I thought was a goal in the past has ended up being a disappointment and things that I have achieved, quote unquote, I would have never dreamed them to be goals in the first place. So I don't know where I remember this from, but I kind of remember Ambrose saying like, I'm going to get every degree I can. I'm going to study this thing inside of school and outside of music in every way I can, because I don't know what the future is going to be. That humility towards what a career or a life in music is, I think is essential, you know, whether you become a leader for the industry and for the artistic movement like he has become, or if you're obscure. I think that the philosophy that he was describing will see you through it and bring you a lot of joy 
and happiness and contentment. Mm -hmm. And um, the true quotient that we should be valuing is, yeah, how happy are you? How yeah. happy are you? And, and what kind of joy are you bringing to others? So, Yeah, man, that's great. I don't think I've heard it put that way. What's it like studying with Dave Brubeck and playing slash touring with your non-net? The, the few times that I got to hang with Dave, I'd say maybe like eight, nine, ten times that we really got to hang. Nice. I, I was too ignorant to really appreciate it at the time, but I appreciated it very much. If that gives you an idea. And he was extremely supportive without being like um, gentle or like, you know, he, 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 he would tell you some shit, you know, that like how it needed to be or what the expectation was or like things like that. And he was super encouraging and um, he was always about the music and he spoke from his experience all the time. Mm -hmm. He would talk about hanging with different cats, hanging with pops and hanging with oh, you wow. know, different experiences that he had. And um, the impression that he left on me was that, you know, he was one of the most famous people in the world at one point and that, he never took that trophy and held it above his head. You know, mm -hmm. if he was aware of how famous or how important he was, I wouldn't have known. And, and so that made a huge impression on me that huh. it, it kind of reminds me of what Bill Murray, I have this memory of like Bill Murray talking about like when they all were on Saturday Night Live and like they were getting real famous. And he says, you got a window about two or three years where either you're going to decide to believe what everybody is telling you about yourself and you let it go to your head. Mm hmm. You know, and if you do that, you kind of get stuck. And, and if you can get out of that in that two to three year window where you realize that you're just a person, you know, mm. then you won't be stuck being an asshole forever, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and I'm a huge proponent of this. It's like we, we don't see ourselves. We don't have a real good idea. Of, I don't I, I'm not going to say like whether I'm a good saxophonist or a bad saxophonist. That's for everybody else to say. Yeah, and yeah, I ain't yeah. going to say whether I'm a good writer or I'm a bad writer. That's for everybody else to say yeah. and for history to turn the page on. And my eyes are in my head. I'm, in, I'm inside. I'm looking out. So, yeah. so every idea that I have about myself is a reflection. And we learn uh, that reflections are distorted. You, know, you go into the funhouse and it's really hard to amalgamate any type of real position in the world. And, and so Dave taught me that. A lot of different experiences taught me that. Um, the other thing that really he made an impression on me was that like he wrote his own music. He had his own song and um, he had his own way of playing. And that was what made him happy, you know. Yeah. And I think that a lot of times like searching for that individual sound has been, mm. you know, a gift that he gave me. He said, you know, you're allowed to do this. You're allowed to go and search for your own song and your own writing and your own style. And um, it doesn't have to be the most modern thing that anybody ever heard. And it doesn't have to be um, too reverential to the past either. Mm -hmm. So wow. yeah, that definitely inspired me in terms of getting with the non-net, writing for the non-net, orchestrating, learning about that stuff. Um, I, I still feel like a neophyte, you know, I should, I should get some lessons or something, you know, with somebody and um, it's been a great vehicle for camaraderie and um, mm -hmm. friendship. All the, all those cats are my friends. And um, yeah, yeah. And I also just have really, been so fortunate that they put themselves into the music i'm not the type of band leader where i would say like i want it to be this way i'm the type of band leader where i do all the work out front and then i want to give it away i give it to the band and they're going to determine and interpret the conclusion that a, a drummer like jimmy mcbride the conclusion that he draws about what a rhythm is or what the vibe is or how he's going to orchestrate his part he is so much more a master at determining that then I could be in trying to suppose what it is, the sound that I want him to play. You know, I, I'd rather let him in his imagination dictate those terms and then, and then see from there, you know, how all these pieces kind of come together when each person, an expert in their own field yeah, yeah. can make their own decision. You know, I'm glad we've been doing it this long. It's hard work. I mean, you know, a large band is, you know, herding cats and, you know, any type of regularity is tough. I'm, yeah. I'm like eternally grateful to Smalls for giving us a home for the last uh, eight years, seven, eight years now. And um, I think we started October of 2012 was our first gig. And then we started our residency March of 13. So year after. Yeah. 
that has been a huge component to us just being able to like play and try to chase a sound and you know it's just like i i believe in repetitions you know it's like if you practice it's like a lot of times the progress is so slow and so deliberate that you don't realize how you're getting better or what you're getting better at and the and the band is kind of taken on that same shape as you do it month after month after month we have expectations of ourselves that in the beginning we didn't have yeah and you just kind of take that for granted that type of growth so yeah yeah, and I always thought it was a pretty neat group uh, having a nonet. You know, you have the extra voice of the guitar, the five horns, mm-hmm. as opposed to like a classic trio for the rhythm section. And um, it's kind of like a mini big band. You kind of yeah. get the same sensibility as a big band, but kind of uh, consolidated into a ten piece group. So I like the all American rhythm section. The guitar, <laughs> like I want to, I like hearing somebody go like, chum, yeah, chum, 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 sometimes. And we got a new record yep. that's supposed to come out in the spring uh you know all components you know uh mm-hmm. and this is like the first time where i've written some stuff where it's really like we're almost like trying to get to that like uh almost like a, not i wouldn't want to say like the bassy sound but like it's almost like a like a tongue-in-cheek version of like this like jump, 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 hmm. jump, jump, interesting you know so. yeah i'll probably be checking that out so far i have uh i'll send you a I'll couple of you. albums i'll get it man <laughs> support you all that's great man <laughs> It's funny because I've been doing some of that with this group, basically treating it like a mini big band. Of course, I'm doing my research on some of that stuff, the early jazz right now, and uh, getting into it's actually before all the swing stuff and the Chuck, yeah. Chuck, Chuck, Freddie Green. Uh-huh. But uh, it's contagious, man, all that stuff, the two beat, the two feel. Yeah. All that stuff. So it's, I'm kind of excited to see what spin you're going to put on it. So, Oh, um, man, I'll share it with you before I come out. I'll share it with you. Okay. I'll send you some shit. By the way, um, when I did uh, a couple of your tunes for a recital recently, I mentioned that I sensed like a connection with the history in your writing. Definitely the playing, of course, but in your writing for that group. So somehow there's, yeah, because you can do all sorts of wild stuff, right? I mean, you have the entirety of the history and beyond, you know, whatever you can yeah. come up with. But uh, And especially like when you orchestrate for the Nanette, there's not as much historical precedent, you know? And so like in in the way that like Bird comes along, and is like just like totally changes the whole way everybody thinks about the music. Mm-hmm. It's like think about after Bird, it was the tenor saxophone. Like the tenor saxophone had a space because Bird was so big yeah. that it's like, all right, well let me just like deal with what Bird was doing, but on tenor, so that way like, you know what I mean? It's like we can deal with the language of the orchestration. But then you put it in this other context and it's like it, it kind of lets you free a little bit yeah. because there's not so much of a precedent. Like exactly. the big band is tough. It's like the big band is tough, man. It's, it's been there's done. Can do. Yeah, exactly. yeah. That's and true. everything is going to be a reference. So if you change the orchestration in one way or in the other, you can still draw on the tradition without it being codified, without it being like direct reference. Yeah. Um, and I found that to be a real freeing thing. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sure <laughs> you notice. Yeah. That's great, man. I'm, yeah, I'm listening. So It's funny, man. Like those five horns is like it really puts you in a in a straight jacket in terms of the range. It's like I understand like when cats are dealing with like orchestra and you got tubas and you got string basses and you got piccolos and you got high winds and you got the whole keyboard available each instrument was made yeah every direction (laughs) and then when we're dealing with like here's the jazz instruments arranged into what is supposed to be like some type of pseudo sax section or pseudo trombone section at different times it's like whoa oh man the range is like getting me sometimes and then sometimes the physical limitations of like you know you don't want to be just and i'm guilty of this all the time like you don't want to just be putting the brass in like middle range long tones like a saxophone section can deal with that easily in the brass it's like you're wearing them yeah. out in like two yeah. seconds so it's it's been a lot of fun interesting time i learned the most from the cats saying like yo this is like come on you know, like come on like <laughs> it's nice though if you're so. chopped but of course you don't want to show up the gigs chopped out as a brass player so <laughs> exactly but it's great exactly. Man. what was the biggest obstacle you've had to overcome the biggest obstacle that I have had to overcome and it feels like running the hurdles because it always comes up. It's a weed that grows in my garden is the sense of self-worth um, and how to value myself and not try to um, abdicate the responsibility of having self-esteem to accomplishment or what others might say. 
it's so easy. As soon as you have a compliment, it's so easy for me to be like, you know, to put that trophy in my case rather than let it come from inside. And as yeah. soon as I think like, man, I really got this thing figured out. Like I'm starting to feel good about myself. I'm in my garden. I'm, I've weeded all my, you know, garden. And I turn around and it's like, you know, little shop at house of horrors or something, you know, it's like that guy is back and he's like, you suck. And you know, nobody likes you. And like, you know, yeah. you're hurting people's feelings and you don't even know how, and like you're selfish. And so it's tough. That's, that's been my biggest struggle. It's like how to get the ego under control. And, um, it's a work in progress for sure. You wow, know, man. every disappointment, every career disappointment, what, what's the greater meaning? I didn't get that gig or, you know, all that type of stuff. And the, the best antidote for me has always been just return to your work, dog. You know, like Jeannie Buss was talking about uh, Phil Jackson recently. And he, he has this saying where he's like, chop wood, carry water, you know, before enlightenment, chop wood, carry water. After enlightenment, chop wood, carry water. Which is essentially like, you know, whatever your state of enlightenment is, do the work. You still got to do your work. Like, yeah, yeah. And I'm like, I'm about that. You know, no matter yeah. what accolade happens. If, if tomorrow everyone's like, he's a fraud, <laughs> da, da, da. You know, uh, let me get back to work. You know, that's been my best shield so far. Which is like, even if somebody is like, yo, you're busted. Yeah, but I'm working on it, though. Yep, <laughs> you know, exactly. like, exactly. <laughs> I'm working on it, though. <laughs> you're right. You and I agree. <laughs> I'm working on it, though. <laughs> That's great, man. I think some of my favorite mentors and the people I look up to are always working on themselves. When I was about 14 years old, I was in a group in Phoenix called the Young Sounds of Arizona. And James Moody was the special guest. And he's a, he was a good friend of the director at the time, this cat named uh, Hugh Lovelady. Uh -huh. And James made such an impression on us backstage. I was in that group with a um, great alto saxophonist, Alex Hahn, who plays with Marcus Oh, Miller. yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, Alex was 13, 14. <laughs> Maybe I was 15 and he was 14. And uh, James Moody, in between sets backstage at this theater – is asking us, do you guys got any diminished patterns that you've been practicing? Can I, I'm going to show you this one I've been working on. And then I show him and he's like, oh, I like that one. You know, that is nice, we, nice. we were all showing each other the diminished patterns we were working on. It's like at that time he had to be in his seventies, right? Seventies. Wow, and man. so it's like, that's the vibe. Yeah. That's the vibe. Yeah. You know, I, I want to be like that. He had no desire to have a pretense mm -hmm. with us beginners you know he he just was vulnerable put it out there i'm practicing i love practicing you know that's I'm, great I'm, man yeah yeah that's definitely the goal for sure man um, right <laughs> sounds like you're working on it <laughs> yeah i'm definitely i'm working on it right now it's right here it's right to the right of me <laughs> <laughs> what is one of the best pieces of advice you have ever received i was at the Dona jazz and the rocks festival and brand from marsalis had his quartet there and while we were hanging in the tent backstage and Branford was saying all kinds of stuff. And then he said, y'all don't have to listen to me now, you know, but just take the advice I'm giving you now and shake your head, say yes. And then sleep on it and be skeptical of what I said tomorrow. Don't be skeptical while somebody is giving you advice, hmm. sleep on it. Then you can measure it tomorrow. And I thought, yeah, that's good advice. Don't block somebody while they're laying it on you. Yeah. Let them lay it on you. You know what yeah. I mean? Like that's, that's, that's valuable. You know, any, anything that Branford wants to tell me now, Branford, tell me now. <laughs> I want to know. Give me a lesson. You know, like yeah, yeah. And the older you get, the, re the more you realize like in your insecurity, in your youth, you're blocking people from helping you. Because you just want to be seen as adequate and you want to be seen as capable. You want to be seen as good. And the truth is, is in your effort to be seen, you're, you're keeping them from reaching down and help lift you up. And, um, yeah. and so I, I'd say like he told me two things, which I value, which is be skeptical, but be skeptical later. <laughs> you know? Yeah. yeah. And that's, that, was, that was some – I really, really appreciated that. That was, wow, that was a good advice. Yeah, thanks for sharing that one, man. Wow. Yeah, no worries. Yeah.
Thanks for reminding me. I, I probably needed that. <laughs> probably came just in time. I needed to be reminded of that one. Yeah, man. How do you balance your personal life and your career life? Poorly. I do it very poorly. My wife and I were both professional musicians. and Before COVID, we were like passing ships in the night. And uh, we would have to be very deliberate about the time we were going to spend together and schedule dates and make sure we schedule vacations together and, and things like that. And right now I'm in a, in a mode of delayed gratification. You know, I'm trying to shed as much as I can during COVID and mm -hmm. try to study as much as I can. And I, I hope things get back to normal because most, most of my social life was predicated on uh, the hang. Like during a tour, you're hanging every night on a gig. That's a hang. That's a party. Yeah. And um, being hosted by a venue or um, someone at their crib or, or something like that, that's like part of the gig as much as anything. Yeah. And so social life is built into what we do. We are, we are social life. Yeah. We're performers. So before COVID, it was a part of the gig, hanging and talking to people and uh, being available. Yeah, now it's like, God, I don't know, man. I think at some point I'm going to have to like – reevaluate how I prioritize because right now my priority is just like the saxophone get better at the saxophone and mm -hmm. learn the music better and that can't that can't be an always thing it, it's not gonna I don't know maybe maybe if, if, if kids come along or something like that happens then priorities will change but right now I don't I don't know that's a tough question for me it's kind yeah. of it, you've exposed me <laughs> <laughs> one thing I was thinking of uh, I guess at some point who was it I think I heard Winton in an interview about um, Eric Lewis. He was just talking about if you're trying to be serious about this at, at least one point in your life, not many points of your life, you have to go into uh, basically a period of deep shedding. And it gets lonely, man. Like, I don't know if you're kind of going through it. I mean, I'm sure you've done it in the past. I know I've done it in the past, but it's hard because you have to have a balance, too. you got to experience life. You can't just live in the shed. But right now we're kind of forced, you know, a lot of us. Yeah. Cyrus Chestnut said in a, uh, in a master class I attended that – Shedding is like swimming in the Olympic sized pool and what you're training to do is to swim in the ocean. And no matter how much you swim in that pool, you know, it ain't gonna prepare you for the ocean. Yeah. So you gotta go out and be part of the world. And that means like, yeah, playing with real people, hanging, being at the session, uh, playing gigs, etc. But I think he also was inferring like you gotta be a person. You gotta go and like sit under a tree and be away set the instrument down so yeah yeah it's tough it's tough i don't know i don't know if anybody has the, the prescription i think it's probably each individual is uh gonna reflect what's inside you know based yeah. on that that stuff so yeah what projects are you currently working on i wrote this show with my very good friend and a longtime collaborator jeremy siskind for the nonet plus two singers called uh mm. golden rule touring test and we debuted it at Dizzy's Club in 2016. We recorded the bulk of it in the summer of 16. And then I've just been sitting on the master since then. And uh, only recently I just like start editing the show and going to try to schedule uh, the vocal session and get the vocals put in. And yep. um, so that's, that's been my, my, that's my next like album project. That's what's going to come out in the spring. And then, um, on top of that, I mean, uh, the, the other thing that I've been doing is I just like the Nonet's book has been getting fat. So we need huh. to get back in the studio and essentially document all the uh, yeah. recent compositions that have been written since That's a Computer came out. Yeah. And uh, usually the first session we did that was Nonet, Nonet, uh, we recorded probably like 10 tracks or something like that or 11, 12 tracks. The second session that we did uh, was two albums it was the answer is no and that's a computer and we recorded 15 or 16 tracks in a day and oh, wow. um so those records are like a side b side the answer is no is the a side and that's a computer is kind of like the alternate takes like the b side of the record and um interesting i'm hoping to do that again i'm hoping like we can go into the studio and get 10 11 12 13 tracks recorded yeah. and then do an a side b side type of um release Nice, man. Cool. Yeah. If you had to leave musicians with only one piece of advice, what would it be? I think that you're always allowed to enjoy playing music. 
and anybody who seeks to take away your joy in music should be disregarded and um, that what we should be doing is celebrating our journey through it and recognize that there is no destination in it and that if we can journey together at different times uh, and support each other in that man we're going to bring so much joy to ourselves and to everyone we touch yeah yeah I said to myself, like, if you're going to teach, then you got to be serious about teaching the way you're serious about playing. You know, don't disrespect all these people who give their lives to education yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and pretend like just because you can play, that means that you're going to be able to communicate anything like to people who need it. And but so since COVID happened, you know, someone someone at a college reached out to me and said, like, hey, are you interested in doing the saxophone chair over here? And I said, yeah, I kind of am. And then that didn't happen. And then I was like, wait a minute. I was almost about I was almost about to do that, you know, because of COVID time. And then I was like, all right, well, maybe I'll ask these cats if like I, I post on Instagram, like, yo, hey, I'm I'm gonna start a saxophone studio. Yeah. And uh it's been super rewarding. And nice, um man. but it's been it's been almost all of my energy thinking about them mm. and thinking about the scene and all the shit that we're talking about right now, trying to impress upon them like about how, how we feel when we practice and like, what's the point? And like, you know, yeah. things that are inside of the jazz education sphere, there's a lot of like things that have kind of get, gotten baked into it that are taken for granted or taken like as just the way things are or the way it's going to go. And I think that it's time for that skepticism. We've all, we all slept on it enough. It's time to be skeptical of like <laughs> yeah. that whole thing. So, and, yeah, yeah, and yeah. to, to reevaluate like maybe the paths for, like I, th I don't think that there's an issue with jazz education as as much as there's an issue with like after you become educated in this thing, like how are you giving to your community? How are you creating value yeah. within your communities? Because right now, if everybody moves to New York and everybody's just like hustling for the twenty five dollars that are here, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. we ain't doing nobody good. We're not doing ourselves good. We're not doing the community any good. We're not doing the world at large any good. Like so, I I think that jazz education isn't an issue. It's mm. about what, what our expectation is after yeah. you're educated. What kind of value does that bring to the world? We have to prove that we belong in this world by saying like, you know, we're adding, we're, we're, we're exactly. contributing to people's joy. And um, if it just ends up being a competition about who can burn and like who, who gets the, you know, one grant awarded per year and who has the one gig at Smalls, it ain't it. That ain't it, you know? And I I do feel very like fortunate that um, with Jeremy Siskin we we played like hundreds of house tours house concerts people who are not like crazy music fans the way we are yeah you know and them hosting their friends in their houses like people who do not go out to see music and bringing like music into their lives and realizing like oh these people are starved for this shit like they need it so bad yeah, and it's man. our job to deliver yeah. it. You know, that's it's, it changed yeah. my life. Man, that's that great. Way. You're teaching these students that. So if they can have that kind of thinking early on, it might be able to change things. Of course, you got to have more teachers out there like that. So. Yeah, true, true. I think we're going to change the culture. You know, I think that a lot of a lot of what jazz education has is the remnant of like a time when jazz and and the world of entertainment was different. And um, they said, all right, now we're going to crash out into the conservatory. I can support my family and do my business. You know, touring isn't a thing anymore. Records aren't a thing anymore. But they carried this um, privilege into those situations. And they're teaching without really understanding, like, yeah, what's next? I think we're the generation where we're saying, like, well, what's next? Yeah. Like, yeah. when we talk about hipsters, it's like, my man down, down the block, you know, he knows about, like, 800 different types of whiskey you know, there should be jazz hipsters opening in a club in, in this town or that town or this town and trying to create a space where people can go and imbibe on this art form, this form of expression, and let their spirit get big. Everywhere, man, too. And not just like the big cities, too, man. There's so much. Exactly. Not only this country, right? You got the whole world. And 
Exactly. Like what, what sense does it make that a club like Smalls is like filled to the brim with people before COVID every night and the rent is so crushing mm. that it's like, are we going to make it? Yeah. How can a business be so successful? Like it's overflowing with people every night and then they're still like, I don't know if we're going to make it. Like that doesn't make any wow, sense. Man. If you take that, I mean, that's maybe an exaggeration, but like if you, you go somewhere else and it's like, you don't have to meet those expectations. And honestly, there's the talent in the world. There's lots of cats that can play that's true. and want to create and do all this thing. And it's like, we don't need to be like, it's almost like a blood clot or something. Sometimes <laughs> I feel like we're all yeah. gathered in these very few spots, but like, yo, go and like sp- spread the gospel. Yeah. It's killing. Go, go, let's go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That song, what was it? Uh, mass production or I can't remember. Yeah. It was kind of about that. Yeah. I thought that was pretty cool. That was what it was about. I hope you get those little jokes in there, little jazz jokes. You <laughs> yeah, know, well, like, I've heard you talk about them, so it seems like at least the compositions that I know pretty well, there's a story behind them. I'm excited for you to hear oh, this new cool, <laughs> Nice. I'm, I'm yeah. curious. You're going to be like, dog, this ain't it. Go back to the old <laughs> stuff. Yeah, right. <laughs> I don't know. We'll see. No, it's yeah. good. I, I like it all, man. So, yeah. Um, but yeah, I won't take up all your time, man. So. No worries. No worries. I really appreciate you, Peter, man. Thanks for taking some time out of your schedule to, Yo, to do anytime. this interview. Of course, anytime. All right, so that's it. I hope you enjoyed the interview and got a lot out of it. I know I did. So if you did indeed enjoy it or even found it interesting, please consider liking it, sharing it, and consider subscribing to my channel if you haven't already. If you have any questions, comments, requests, etc., please leave it down below in the comment section. And until then, we'll see you all next time. Peace.